This is the BBC. This podcast is supported by advertising outside the UK. If you're listening to this podcast, you must recognize the value of asking questions. At Aramco, our questions help us engineer a better future. How can today's resources fuel our shared tomorrow? How can we deliver energy to a world that can't stop? How can we deliver one of the fuels of the future? How can we sow curiosity to harvest ingenuity? To learn more about how innovation drives us forward, visit aramco.com slash powered by how. BBC Sounds, music, radio, podcasts. Hello, hello. This is Inside Science, first broadcast on the 25th of November 2021. NASA has launched a space mission to defend planet Earth from the asteroids. We'll be looking at what's involved. And how do we decide what to call things? Do the words in our languages sound like what they mean? But first, malaria is a horrible disease. It kills more than a million people each year. It's caused by an infection with a single-celled parasite called a plasmodium, which is carried from person to person inside the body of a biting mosquito. Now, there's been a lot of research into ways to treat or prevent this plasmodium infection in people and ways to eliminate infectious mosquitoes. But no one's really looked at what the mosquitoes get out of carrying this infectious plasmodium burden. Now, Anne Carr, a visiting scholar of Vanderbilt University in Nashville, had a suspicion that for the disease to be so successful, the plasmodium had to provide some sort of benefit for the mosquitoes. And she set out to prove it. The problem was it's extremely difficult to recreate the setup of mosquitoes, humans and plasmodia as they occur in a natural community setting in the lab. There's always that risk that, you know, your artificial infections could be leading to artifactual data. And, you know, we really wanted to address what is pertinent and what is happening in nature. And it was an extremely difficult task to do, you know, kudos to our lab because we we stuck through it through a year of testing. And at some point, you know, we weren't entirely sure we were actually going to be able to achieve it. But we, we got to the point where we were able to document, you know, these low level intensity of, of plasmodium that mimic essentially what's been documented in nature in Africa. And we were so excited. And that was the point where we said, we have to do this sequencing. We have to publish this paper. This is pivotal information. And it's really going to turn the tides for malaria research. Because what we found out was, you know, it's actually maybe a symbiotic relationship for the mosquito. So there's actually a benefit to the mosquito for carrying this plasmodium. Yes, it was um, It was sort of wild. We were really excited when we found that out. And what sort of ends up happening is it's sort of that, you know, that saying when you're a kid, you know, your parents want you to be exposed to germs because it's going to, you know, give you this robust immune response that'll help you later in life. You know, we're kind of seeing that same interaction with the mosquitoes, you know, these exposures to you know, natural, very low level intensities of plasmodium are almost priming their immune system and giving them all of these benefits that we're seeing much later on in life when they kind of get towards the tail end of their lifespan. I mean, it's really interesting and it makes a lot of sense from what we know about evolutionary biology that there would be something in it for the mosquitoes um, and this uh, strengthening of their immune system so that they can then fight other pathogens makes sense. And it's a remarkable finding. But the way you came to that finding is kind of extraordinary as well, because obviously there are a lot of restrictions to how on earth you can carry out these experiments. Tell me, how did you do it in the lab? Yeah, it was actually um, really difficult. It took us about a year to get to the point where we could even submit our samples off for testing. And we just basically took colonies of mosquitoes and fed them essentially blood that was spiked with different amounts of plasmodium gametocytes. And it took a couple tries because, you know, the first few times we did it, the intensities that we were seeing were just much too high and not what we were really looking for. But, you know, it did get to a point where 
we were able to at least preliminarily have an infection intensity we were happy with, but then we kind of went a step further and said, there's always the risk that a mosquito in, you know, ingests the plasmodium parasite, but it doesn't actually become infectious. That was something that was really important for us as we wanted to look at mosquitoes that were infectious. They have this plasmodium parasite that's successfully invaded their salivary glands and is capable of then transmitting it to a host. So how did you test for that? Um, We just did some really rigorous PCR tests. We did about 300 individual PCR tests on 300 individual mosquitoes, kind of testing their salivary glands to see essentially if they had the plasmodium parasite present or not. Because the malarial plasmodium has got all these different life stages that it goes through in its life cycle from the oocytes to the various different ones inside the mosquito and also inside our own bodies. So it's really quite a a remarkable parasite. But what you found was really fascinating that infection with this plasmodium actually confers an advantage to the mosquitoes And you actually found that their immune systems were strengthened. How did you find that out? Yes. So we did, you know, RNA transcriptome analysis, you know, essentially between these really rigorously tested, identified infectious stage mosquitoes. And we compared those to uninfected controls that had been blood fed, reared out to 28 days to kind of give us a really nice comparison between our infectious mosquitoes and our controls. And, you know, the great thing about next generation sequencing is you do get an overwhelming wealth of information you're doing with transcriptomics. So some of it is, you know, maybe a little theoretical and you always have to follow up with behavioral studies. But that was where, you know, in the meat of that sequencing data set that we saw all of these immunological markers that kind of pointed to the fact that the infectious mosquitoes were actually the fitter ones, and those were the healthier ones compared to the uninfected controls. So uh, this plasmodium, malaria must have evolved. It co-evolved along with mosquitoes, and it confers an advantage, a survival advantage to the mosquitoes. But obviously malaria is is this horrible, horrible disease that is still killing millions of people. And one of the ways we're trying to get rid of it is to get rid of either the plasmodium or to get rid of the mosquitoes. And it sounds like if we were to get rid of the plasmodium, that would actually have a a bad effect on the mosquitoes. I mean, that's a great thought. I mean, it does seem like, you know, that population of mosquitoes that is carrying the plasmodium parasite, if you were to remove it, they essentially, based on our research, you know, putatively wouldn't be living as long. They wouldn't be feeding as robustly. They wouldn't be as much of a nuisance to the susceptible populations. And I think one of the effects of carrying the plasmodium, the the reason it's better, you you, uh, suggest in your paper, the reason it's better at finding food is perhaps that it increases or enhances the mosquito's sense of smell or taste. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Um, And, you know, that enhanced olfactory response, it's really going to carry down the line for, you know, more sensitive host seeking, more sensitive blood feeding. And, you know, they also use olfaction for oviposition. So, you know, perhaps more robust reproduction. Um, But on the opposite side of the coin, you know, more blood feeding and more, you know, host seeking, it benefits the plasmodium parasite because each one of those opportunities is another uh, possibility for tra- disease transmission. And Carr there on the extraordinary symbiotic relationship between the mosquito and malaria parasite. Now, 65 million years ago, an asteroid forever changed life on Earth when it crashed into what is now the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. Could we face the same terrible end as the dinosaurs? Three, two... One, zero. Mission, lift off. Falcon 9 with the DART mission, on the way for humanity's first ever planetary defense test mission. Well, that was yesterday as NASA launched a demonstration of the world's first planetary defense mission, aimed at intercepting an asteroid to change its course. 
Nancy Chabot and Andy Rivkin, planetary scientist at Johns Hopkins, are leading different parts of the DART mission. And they told us they found an ideal double asteroid system to test it on. There are two asteroids there. There's Didymos, the larger one, 780 metres in diameter. And there's Dimorphos, the smaller one, goes around every 11 hours and 55 minutes. We've been looking at it for decades with telescopes here on the Earth. They discovered it. But this is a great way to do this test because DART's going to come in and hit that smaller moon. And it's just going to demonstrate asteroid deflection within this asteroid system. So it's just going to change slightly how Dimorphos goes around Didymos by maybe 1% change in that orbital period. So maybe it'll be about 10 minutes slower, maybe 5 minutes, maybe 20 minutes. It's one of the main measurements. And I think that that's why this double asteroid system is such a great way to do this test. Yeah. And, and the technique that is being tested, the kinetic impactor, what DART is doing, it's taking the spacecraft and ramming it in to the object you're worried about, or in our case, testing and not worried about, to change its orbit. The, the problem with asteroid impacts is that the orbit of an asteroid and the orbit of the Earth intersect, and both are going to be at the same place at the same time. And the way we deflect asteroid, it's, it's not like a, a goalie kind of you know, sweeping something aside. It's that we either speed up or slow down the object we're, that we want to move. Um, and the measurements, as, as Nancy said, the Didymos Dimorpho system is a great place to do that because the measurements are a lot easier to make in this uh, binary system that's basically showing Dimorphos moving in front of and behind Didymos from the point of view of Earth. So how hard do you have to hit an asteroid to deflect it? Are we talking the scale of a Death Star attack out of Star Wars? <laughs> uh, in terms of, um, you know, sometimes we hear about uh, impacts, you know, something like, you know, the, whatever wiped out the dinosaurs, you know, give it, having the energy equivalent of some un, unthinkable amount, you know, all of the, you know, all of the arsenals, of the, you know, it's something crazy like that. We are not doing that to Dimorphos. Um, I think um, we calculated it just the other day for fun. The number I'm coming up with is, uh, that I'm remembering is that it was something like 100 million times, you know, uh, Serena Williams' you know, hardest serve. <laughs> so it's, it's a lot. You don't want to... A really get, useful analogy there. Yeah, so, I, I but I mean, Serena I has an awesome one, serve, so really we should yeah, you know, give it... I, I but yeah, I mean, yeah. it's uh, 6.6 kilometers per second. So, you know, it's, it's coming in fast. It's definitely the spacecraft is going to be completely destroyed. There will be, you know, maybe little shards of it left, um, but not enough to, like, melt it or anything like that necessarily with the impact either. And the spacecraft is so much smaller than the asteroid. The main body of the spacecraft um, that has the most of the mass is about 100 times smaller than the asteroid that it's impacting. So it comes in fast, but it's really small. And that's just kind of gives it this small nudge in that. Uh, and this is the sort of thing like Andy was saying that, you know, just changes the position slightly that would add up to a big change over a long time. And that's how you would want to do this technique if you needed it in the future. Yeah, the, the point of a kinetic impactor and the point of most of these techniques is not to, you know, have a Death Star kind of blow it into a zillion pieces, but to keep keep it intact and just kind of move it a little bit. Just give it a little a little bump. Definitely deflection, not disruption. Is yeah, so, yeah, so we're coming in fast with DART, but not not intending to do anything other than to kind of give it a bump. The great thing about this mission is we'll be able to see the asteroid impact because DART is carrying cameras. Uh, the main body of the spacecraft has a camera that's called Draco. This camera is going to show us what this asteroid looks like, but actually it's a key component of making sure we actually hit the asteroid with DART too. Because the thing is, you can't actually tell the difference between Didymos and Dimorphos until the last hour of the mission. Before that, they both look like the same single point of light and you're going towards there. And so it has to all be done autonomously. So Draco takes the images and uh, figures out where the smaller asteroid is and uh, fires the thrust, tells commands to fire the thruster with smart nav developed at APL that we're really proud of and goes into the asteroid and then hits it head on with Draco. But, uh, and then, you know, those images come streaming back to earth and they're going to be spectacular. The last one is going to show us sort of the impact site for DART, where we actually hit what the asteroid shapes are and all of that. But uh, then there's the Italian Lichia CubeSat. Yeah. The uh, Italian space agency built uh, a CubeSat, which is about the size of, of a laptop or, or a cereal box. Uh, that is uh, also now flying along. I can't believe I can say it, it is flying it's in, in space. space. It is in space. It's crazy. <laughs> it's a great day. <laughs> it is. Um, and uh, Leech Cube has two cameras, 
and uh, you know, I, I, I guess I made the, the Death Star shout out before. The cameras are called Luke and Leia, which is awesome. Yeah, I'm a huge um, Star Wars fan, so um, one of them is is a color camera and has a slightly lower resolution. One is just a, a black and white, just a single, you know, monochrome, and has higher spatial resolution. Uh, Leech Cube is going to be released by Dart uh, something like ten days ahead of its arrival. Um, at Demorphos, and it'll kind of trail behind. It'll move off to the side, so it doesn't also hit. But it's then gonna gonna make its approach closest approach about three minutes, I think, after after the dart impact, and it'll document what what happened. It'll take images of the debris cloud, uh, which will then be sent back to Earth and um, and analyzed and and uh, you know help uh, help interpret the what what happened and interpret the surface of Demorphos. And then after it passes, it turns around and it takes pictures of the far side of, uh, of Demorphos, the side that Dart won't see because it's just on a one-way trip. So um, it's great. And the Italians are justly proud. This is the first deep space Italian, uh, first deep space mission the Italian Space Agency is carrying out by themselves. Now, fun as this mission test is, Nancy and Andy point out that asteroids are not uncommon and even small ones can pose a real threat. Uh, there is an asteroid that is coming very close to Earth in 2029 that people are very interested in. Uh, it's an asteroid named Apophis, and uh, so people have been interested in in studying that, but we know the orbit very, very well. We know it's going to come close to Earth, but it's not going to hit the Earth. If one were, you know, going to uh, Monte Carlo and, you know, someone offered, you know, odds on what's the next asteroid to hit the Earth, you know, you should play the field. You know, there's no, no named object. Is You know, it's very likely the next impact is going to be something that we do not currently know. The Earth has been hit by asteroids for billions of years. This is not new. Yeah. There are things out there, and uh, the Earth will be here for many, many, many years in the future. So it's really great that we're getting to this point where we're developing capabilities to potentially be able to prevent that in the future for the first time. Well, there you go, you know. If you could say, hey, there's going to be not only there's going to be a hurricane that strikes this place 30 years from now, or earthquake that strikes this place 30 years from now and also we can take steps to stop the hurricane from happening or stop the earthquake certainly you would do it um so this is uh you know similar in a lot of ways and i just think it's great that we're getting past this step of like talking about it and actually taking a step to demonstrate one of these capabilities in space it might be that a kinetic impactor isn't your choice it might be that you want to do something that's more of what they call these slow push methods where you uh you know fire ion you know beam thrusters at it slowly over many many years or gravity tractors or or whatever um it's hard to speculate, I think, exactly what you would want to do, but uh, characterizing it, getting as much information as possible and as much warning time as possible are always going to be key. Yeah, and it's also, I think, another interesting piece that DART will do is we are going to mess up, you know, an asteroid. We're going to throw a bunch of debris up, and we don't know how the asteroid system is necessarily going to... One of one of the asteroids or is uh, is rotating, you know, very fast. There's some speculation, if you imagine having to deflect an asteroid that's spinning very fast. How is that going to work? Um, there are people that are interested in interacting with asteroid surfaces for economic reasons. There are people who are interested in the science of interacting with asteroid surfaces. So we'll be um, uh, generating data that even goes beyond planetary defense and into some of these other fields. As we know from Star Wars, a powerful weapon can come with a fatal flaw. Is there a chance that our asteroid defense system could actually make things worse? There is the concern of of disrupting asteroids, which is why, like you know, like we said, we're gonna we just want to give it a little a little nudge. We don't want to we don't want to disrupt it. We don't want to blow it into a bunch of pieces. We just want to keep it in one piece. You know, we we don't necessarily know where that line is. We think we are well on going to be well on one one side of that line with Dart. Uh, some people on the team have noted that some experiments recently from Hayabusa two say have created craters that were bigger than they were expecting. Um, yeah, I think that's all just a great example of why you need to do this test in space on a on a real asteroid, right? I mean, yeah. you know, because you can do things at this small scale here on Earth in the labs, but, you know, getting out there on the real asteroid, you know, but, you know, that said, even, uh, you know, any uh, ejector debris that comes from darts impact much, much smaller spacecraft on this much larger asteroid that's bound already by the larger Didymos, um, you know, asteroid that's there that it's going around, you know, makes this a a really safe way to do the DART test. 
Um, and you know, for the if you did need to apply this in the future, you do want to do something like this because you don't make your problem worse. Like Andy was saying, you know, that this is not about blowing it up into many pieces and then having to worry about many pieces that are headed your way, but keeping it under control, a small nudge, so that those trains are not on a course to collide in the future. Nancy Chabot and Andy Rifkin on the DART mission. And we'll have to wait 10 months for it to journey the almost 7 million miles to reach the asteroid before we know the outcome. And it's not the only exciting mission leaving Earth. The James Webb Space Telescope, successor to the Hubble, has been 30 years in the making and is expected to launch in December. Now this week, NASA announced that the tests of the $10 billion telescope had revealed a potentially faulty clamp. So the launch date is now delayed once more to 22nd of December. It's a hugely complex, expensive and ambitious mission because the telescope has to be folded up for blast-off on the rocket and then carefully unfurled once it's reached orbit in a process that takes two trepidatious weeks. BBC science correspondent John Amos was one of the last people to see the Webb telescope in the flesh before it was attached to the launch adapter a couple of weeks ago. And he spoke to the European Space Agency project manager, Peter Jensen. So the thing about looking at Webb in the clean room, all finished, is it's actually quite mesmerising. Uh, the colours of it, the, the gold of the mirrors, uh, this sort of silver purple of all of the, uh, the insulation covering, the, uh, the sun shield and everything. And Peter Jensen is a, a long-time project manager for the European Space Agency on this mission. P- Peter, what, what do you think when you look at it? Yeah, when I saw it, when the first time I walked in, I somehow couldn't believe that it was in this pristine stage. After years of integration, after years of being, let us say, people around it. So I, I compared it almost like a toy, you know, you un- the kid unpacked the toy and it is in this glossy appearance. Uh, but this is when you unpack it. We have been working on this mission for, for eight years in integration phase. So uh, that is in this, let us say, glossy, pristine appearance, I think is a big, big uh, compliment to the, to the ART team. Why has it taken so long? Can you explain that? to us. Why why has it taken three decades, really, hasn't it, to to do this? Yeah, I mean, first, we started, let's say, the real building phase, uh, 2005, or let's say the initial preliminary design phase, and then, of course, the hardware building is coming later. And and for the Europeans, uh, we we delivered instrument in 2012, MIRI, and uh, Nierspec in 2013. (laughs) And from 2013 to today, basically, there has been what we call a system integration and test phase. Uh, one example is the uh, optical test we did in Houston, in the big Apollo uh, thermal rack chamber. If you add everything together with the transport, it's a test taking around half a year. And so this is just one test for ISIM, the Integrated Science Instrument Module. We had three thermal tests. They, they did not take a half a year each of them. All the tests were done in Goddard, but it's still a significant test. And of course, you cannot afford f- failures. So when we do things, we do it very carefully, in a very slow pace, so we, we, any damage of this satellite, uh, whether on the outside and, and mainly on the inside, will, will have a, such a high penalty in terms of repair time. So everything happens in a slow and controlled pace. I mean, the and fact, that takes time. The, the fact that you know, it, it was delayed, I mean, oh. the, these delays are, are somewhat famous, aren't they? That really kind of should have been expected, really, on a project this difficult? Mm, I mean, I think we always go in with an optimistic mindset when we do planning. Maybe it's also easier to get funding when we're optimistic. And, and we have done so many things for the first time. And, you know, we can anticipate, anticipate, and anticipate, but, you know, there's always surprises. Uh, so there is, uh, we have had actually on Nearspec as well, we have had to exchange uh, the micro shutter and the detectors after we delivered to Goddard. And this is, again, okay, this is not driving the schedule, but it's just one of those unanticipated moments that, uh, or, or events that where you have to, uh, you're not scheduled for. And we're ready now, essentially. We're ready yes. now, we're ready now, yes. Uh, next, uh, next Tuesday, we will mate with what we call the payload adapter, and this is you, uh, the ring which sits on top of the rocket and interface with the satellite. So we're basically done here, uh, and we are busy preparing the adapter. We, uh, last night, we did the electrical verification that the harness which uh, bridges between the rocket and the satellite is all okay, and that's the case. So Tuesday is, in a way, a big moment when launcher hardware and satellite see each other for the first time. 
Yeah, I guess that when you put it on the adapter, that means everything is done with yeah, web, yeah? yeah? Yeah, and that's the case. So all the electrical verification, all the close-out, there are many, let us say, small patches uh, where we have to, let's say, close uh, the thermal surfaces, MLI, and that, that's done. They still, we, we will have a lift when we lift onto the, onto the uh, payload uh, adapter. Uh, there's still uh, four holes, you could say, the lifting holes, and they will stay open until we sit on the rocket, and then they will be closed. Right, and, and then at some point you've got a fuel web, haven't yeah. you, and then put it right on top of the Ariane 5. Yeah, right. So basically, so we, we do sli- things slightly different on this, on this mission. So we will first go on the adapter, and then we'll go to the fueling area, S5B it's called. Uh, and this, of course, is a, is a hazardous operation, so there will be a very limited, let's say, access to the satellite for very few people. And this is also why this is a kind of a sweet moment, because it's the last, you could say, day or days where public has a visibility to the mission. And to European citizens, what do you say, Peter, about the value, the worth of doing this mission? Yeah, on face value, there's a lot of zeros. And Europe has spent 700 million euro on this mission. But, you know, when you look at it as a cost per inhabitant in Europe, it comes down to a cheap cup of coffee in a cheap cafe, uh, drank over a period of 20 years, and then I think it's, it's really cheap that we get access to such a high-performed observatory in space. It's like a big Columbus journey to, uh, to let us say, an unknown period in our history, universe history. So I think, I think we get a lot of bucks for the money. Peter Jensen talking to John Amos. And do catch our special Inside Science about the mission in a couple of weeks. And spare a thought for the world's astronomers this Christmas who will be anxiously following the telescope's progress. Now to language, which is basically a communication tool with rules. The words we speak are the units of meaning with which we build the endless complexity of ideas we wish to communicate. But the words themselves, whether spoken or written, don't have to sound or look like what we're trying to convey. They're just symbolic stand-ins. But now, research by Alexandra Sviek at the ZAS Institute in Berlin is challenging this. Already, I think very early on, philosophers, and especially Plato, um, has kind of uh, given a seed of this idea that the sounds that uh, are in words have a certain meaning, and they're not arbitrary. But then this theory kind of got under, and we started looking at uh, language as is, and that it's a gift we got, and it's arbitrary. So this was uh, this has been an ongoing theory, and. As a student, I also learned it as an axiom, right? I just took it. It was just given to me. I took it. Uh, Words are arbitrary. Um, But um, recently, um, more research on iconicity has started uh, coming up to the surface. And bubakik is actually not a new phenomenon at all. It was first um, mentioned by Wolfgang Kühler, a gestalt psychologist, who started it, um, who, who published a book in 1929, then redid it in the 40s. So it's quite an old phenomenon. And, and back then he studied two groups, uh, English speakers and I believe uh, an indigenous group in, in the Tenerife in, in the Spanish um, island. Um, and he saw that these spiky shapes are uh, connected with the word that he came up with, uh, taquete, and round shapes are connected with another word he came up with, baluba, later transferred to maluma. So the idea is that maluma is, has got a sort of rounded, softer sort of sound to it, um, and taketa um, is much more spiky. And so, so the, the shape that you're describing sort of fits that, that oral sound. Exactly, and, and why is that? We, ha- we seem all to kind of have a feeling that Maluma, just, you, you just said it, it feels kind of round. It has these round uh, sounds in it, but we don't see sounds, we hear them. So the idea behind it is that um, there is a, a relationship between two modalities, a visual modality uh, which can convey shapes and an auditory modality or acoustic modality which conveys sounds that we perceive and connect with the visual shapes. And this is exactly what Buba and Kiki taps into. So the, the word Buba is, is a very sort of rounded 
um, sound to people, whereas the word kiki is is quite spiky. And so people identify when when they're shown shapes, a rounded shape or a spiky sort of star shape, they identify them with these meaningless words, booba or kiki. We see a pattern in how they identify. And um, for some time it was thought that because booba has got that rounded um, lettering of the B and Kiki has the spiky um, symbol of the K. That might be the reason behind it. But you've now constructed this new study. Tell me the method, because I think it's really, it's really quite cool. We were lucky enough to have wonderful collaborators uh, around the world uh, with uh, the help of whom we were able to reach uh, speakers, native speakers of 25 different languages from nine language families and 10 writing systems. And we first assess how they match the, this visual form, round form, to the sound of booba or kiki, and, and, and of course also the, the spiky form to the sound of booba and kiki. And uh, we saw that there are, so globally, uh, across these languages, there is a high tendency to match them, booba to the round form and kiki to the spiky form. Right. So, so this was an online study and exactly. you showed them two shapes, one that's a bit more flowery, looking a, a little bit like you might imagine a flower or a cloud as drawn by a child, a sort of rounded shape. And this kiki is a very sort of spiky star. Yes. So they saw two shapes and then they heard one of the words. So I spoke these words. Um, uh, we recorded them. So imagine you see those two, a uh, flower and a star, and you hear booba with which shape do you connect this and the people just answered and we saw a a correct answer only if it matched both booba to round and kiki to star shape uh, which is quite a conservative method because we had this richness of writing systems we also wanted to see whether people rely on the roundness or spikiness of the letters that are used in the given writing systems and uh, we collected participant ratings to the written forms of Buba and Kiki in all these 10 scripts that we had. And we actually found that this is not the case. People don't rely on this uh, roundness or spikiness rating of written forms to judge Buba and Kiki forms. Because, of course, among your um, enormous among number of uh, countries, people don't all use the Roman alphabet. They have completely different writing systems. Exactly. So Georgian, if for me, it looks all the letters are round, <laughs> right? Uh, and maybe Japanese has more of a spiky shape to it, generally. And um, still, we saw that uh, people who come from Georgia, who come from Japan, they don't necessarily rely on uh, the judgment of the spikiness or roundness of their letters um, to uh, correctly ma- match uh, visual shapes to the auditory forms of Buba and Kiki. But nevertheless, even without having that match that we do with our Roman alphabet, you found that across all these different language groups, people still were more likely to match the rounded sound of booba to the flower shape and the kiki to the star shape than than would have happened just just by chance. Yes, we found it across most of the languages, but not all of the languages. Some uh, groups, some native speakers, um, uh, showed a converse effect or didn't show a preference really. And uh, what we take from that is that in some languages, there might be words that sound like booba or kiki that confound their um, feeling of uh, the word to the form. So, for example, in Romanian, the word booba is a, a, a generic term for wound that you use to small children. And wound may be sharp pain, sharp figure. You see where I'm getting at. Right. So the, the actual meaning of the word is kind of overriding that that very subtle uh, sound effect. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So this might be the case for Romanian, for Turkish, for example, where a word Gigi exists and it means cute. And naturally we connect cute with roundness. So there is generally a preference for, uh, for round shapes. And also when you think of babies, they, are, um, they have a totally different bodily proportion than adults. And their heads are round, they have round eyes, very big. 
and we often call babies cute. <laughs> and maybe um, this could also override the effect in Turkish. Um, uh, so, uh, so this is a possibility. Um, and also that just the sound of words booba and kiki might be uh, somehow forbidden in some languages. Um, so for the future, it would be great to test more words, not just booba and kiki, but other words that that evoke this uh, correspondence between roundness and sound and, and conversely spikiness and sound. So this this link you found between the the sort of the uh, roundness and softness of the sound and the sharpness and the sharpness of a shape it gives us some sort of clues perhaps to the origins of how language evolved and perhaps there were vocal attempts to represent the shapes of things with our words and perhaps that's how it started. I very much believe so. And for that, we should also not only study made-up words like we did, um, but also study true lexica of uh, words uh, of languages across the world to see whether more round concepts have more of these round um, sounds, uh, acoustic segments. And this actually colleagues uh, colleagues of us, uh, David Sidu and and. Uh, um, and his um, uh, colleagues did that for English lexicon, and um, they found that there is this correspondence that that generally words that are connected with the concept of roundness have more of round sounds, and we can therefore see that correspondences like this, like booba kiki, which is made up, like right, there is no word booba or kiki, but they can give us insights into how this might have shaped our preference at the very core of language to name things. Alexandra Sviek there on the intriguing origins of our languages. That's all from this week's Malarial Mysteries, Space Sorties and Word Wrangling. Next week, the fabulous Victoria Gill will be in the seat. I'm Gaia Vince. Technical production was by Jackie Marjoram. The producer was Alex Mansfield. And Inside Science is made in association with The Open University. If you're listening to this podcast, you must recognize the value of asking questions. At Aramco, our questions help us engineer a better future. How can today's resources fuel our shared tomorrow? How can we deliver energy to a world that can't stop? How can we deliver one of the fuels of the future? How can we sow curiosity to harvest ingenuity? To learn more about how innovation drives us forward, visit aramco.com slash powered by how.